All right, we're ready to start chapter five, which is probability. Now we spent the first few chapters talking about how to get data and then how to organize it and find some important things like uh, the mean or the standard deviation or the z-scores or in chapter four, you know, bivariate data, you know, how do we find the linear regression equation and stuff like that. So what we want to do ultimately is we want to take those things like the mean for a sample and then talk about what it must be for the population. But the problem with that is that you don't know what the population is like. So you need some rules for how to deal with the future unknown things. And that's what probability is going to do for us. So let's, let's think about probability for just a second. So it seems like a simple idea, but measurements were invented out of necessity to compare things necessity to compare things. So for example, is a classroom longer than it is wide? What tool would you use that to find? Well, you're measuring length and you'd use a ruler or tape measure or something like that. Okay. So that's how you can compare lengths. So they invented rulers and tape measures so that they could figure out whether one thing is longer than another. Okay, does it take you longer to run a mile or eat a pizza? Okay, so you're measuring time. Okay, and you'd use a clock or a stopwatch, which is a glorified clock, right, etc. So we start off, you know, back in ancient times, first wanting to know, hey, is this thing bigger than this thing? Do you have more than me, etc. So you want to measure things like length and height and stuff. And then you start going, okay, well, now I want to measure the time it takes to do something, right? So if you go to a science teacher, they'll tell you that these things are important, right? Knowing how to measure length is important. Knowing how to measure time is important. Right, you go to any science class and they'll talk to you about these things directly, you know, measuring the density of this, you know, mixture or this liquid or the vascosity of this, right? But what they don't say all the time in science class, but it's just as important, is odds. So are the chances better for rolling boxcars in a game of craps or randomly drawing an ace out of a deck of cards? So which measuring device could we use? And the answer is we're measuring odds, right? So let me put it this way. You're measuring the future or unknown events, things that you can't know for sure, um, or the future, things that haven't happened yet. And we use probability to do that, or odds is another one, right? So we're using probability to measure this. Um, another thing that you can do with this is measuring risk. I mean, when you're in science class and you're in the lab, what do they do the first week, right? The first week they say, you know, here's where you go if, you know, you got acid in your eye. Here's how to wash it. Here's, you know, these are the important rules we have. You have to wear goggles. You have to do this. You have to do that. Why do they do all of that? Well, because inadvertently they're talking about probability right? You know, there are chances that you'll mess up and really get burnt. There are chances that you will mess up and, you know, I don't know, cause an accident, cause a fire. You have to know how to deal with those things. They'll also talk about it in terms of they know that when you do an experiment in the lab, not everything works out minute rice perfect, right? Well, that's probability. You know, what are the chances of it getting this way or the chances of it going this way, etc. So science teachers will often in class, they'll talk about these kinds of measurements, time, length, you know, density, weight, all that stuff, moles. And they'll indirectly talk about this, but not necessarily directly. But it is still really important. It's important for things other than just science class. So um, that's why we're going to spend some time learning about it in Chapter 5. I just want to mention this thing. It is the measurement that allows us to link statistics with the real world. The real world does not work perfectly, right? How does it work? Well, probability kind of sets that up for us. It's going to work give or take, you know, this and that. It's going to have a lot of wiggle to it, and probability is going to be our way of dealing with that wiggle. It's our way of measuring how much gray we have in our problems. And then we'll be able to take that gray that we'll have some numerical representation for with probability and use it to make inferences from the in the latter chapters. 
All right, so with that said, let's think about dice. <laughs> so um, we have to get some definitions under our belt. Um, first thing we want to know is probability. So probability for our purposes is the measurement of the likelihood of events that may have yet to occur. Um, we're going to be talking about things that are in the future. You can use those often to um, work for things that just haven't happened yet or things that you don't know, that kind of thing. So but we'll talk about it being for the future. Oops, don't need to know that. All right, probability of an outcome, O, is abbreviated P of O. And probabilities can be written as decimals, percents, or fractions. We will ch tend to write them as decimals most of the time, um, but not always, but that's how we'll write them. All right, a probability experiment is any process with uncertain results that can be repeated over and over, um, and a sample space is the collection of all possible outcomes. So let's think about a six-sided die. I have a picture of one of my dice on one of my tables in my office, actually. All right, so what does it mean to say that the dice excuse me, that die is fair, die is singular, dice is plural. So it means that each side, you know, let me type this, hold on. Okay, there we go. For the die to be fair, it means that each side is equally likely. In other words, it's not loaded. It's not like, you know, fives are going to show up more often than anything else. It's that all the sides have an equal shot of occurring. All right, then what are the outcomes? This is kind of long-winded. Um, we we identify each simple event with a little e for event, with a little subnotation for. So, example, this one it's e1, e2, e3, and so on. So, and with a six-sided die, it's really easy because every event is its own side. So, um, every simple event, excuse me. So, the possible outcomes are. You could roll a 1, you could roll a 2, you could roll a 3, and so on. I'm ignoring the dots thing, and I'm just writing what the number would be. So, for example, 5 dots makes a 5, right? All right, and then what's the sample space? Well, the sample space is all the possible outcomes. So, in this case, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, because it's a 6-sided die. All right. I think we got time for the next page. So events. Events are more interesting to us. I mean, we all know that a six-sided die has got six sides. whoop de doo So what's more interesting to us um, is the excuse me, collections that we can make. So we can call them simple events or, you know, and outcomes, right? These were the simple events and so on. So we could call them that or we could say, you know, hey, what about even numbers? That's an event, and it has a collection of different sides in it. So events, in other words, can be bigger than just one of the sides, one of the outcomes. Right? So um, there are some events that are just one outcome. That's fine. Those are called simple events, hence the name for them back here. Okay. All right. So define the event. The side facing up is divisible by 2. Okay. So divisible by 2 is a fancy word of saying even, right? So that event, E, is equal to, well, let's think. On a six-sided die, what sides are divisible by two? Right? So it's two, four, and six. Right? The even numbers. It's a fancy way of seeing even. <laughs> so there's event E. Now what about the probability of E? Okay, so if that's event E, the probability of E capital P of E is equal to, well, there's three sides out of six sides total, which we all know, hopefully, is a half, which is 0 0.5, or 50%. And I wrote it all different ways so you could see it. There's a fraction, there's a decimal, there's a percent. Sometimes we want the reduced fraction. Um, sometimes we don't. It just depends. It's just a question of ease for our own sanity's sake. So, there you go. So I wrote it all different ways. Now what we just did there is something called a classical probability. You didn't roll the die and check things out. What you did was you imagined that all the sides of the die were equally likely and then you figured out the number of ways that you could get E to occur, the number of ways you could get something divisible by 2 to occur. And you divided that 3 divided by the 6, but it was all kind of in your head, right? It's all hypothetical. So classical probability is one of the main ways that probability came into existence in the first place. There are a couple mathematicians back in the, uh, I want to say, 1600s that gambled. Um, and they figured out the rules of probability, and they kept them secret to themselves. And they made money off of all their rich friends gambling with them because they could figure out the rules for the games more than 
their friends could. And then after they died, the books were published that explained how they had done it and how they had lived their lives, the, the mathematical probability books. Um, Cardano is one of those, and I know there's one other if you're interested. So the fundamental assumption is that everything is equally likely. So when you look at this, you assume that everything is equally likely. Um, and that everything's fair and you can figure out the probabilities. You don't have to roll this die. You can just know, right? Before I take off from this page, I just want to mention that it's classical probability is literally classical. <laughs> like the guys that were first thinking about the ideas of probability, um, Laplace and Fermat and uh, Cardano, who I mentioned before, the gambler, and um, various other um, mathematicians, they thought about everything in these hypothetical ways. They didn't conduct experiments. They, you know, thought about cards and dice and um, figured out those rules. So um, that's another reason it's called classical. So it's very hypothetical. It's very tied to gambling and um, those kinds of probabilities. But of course, you can use gambling ideas for other things. All right, so let's look at a poker deck. If you don't know what a poker deck looks like, you should get um, solitaire on your computer and start learning. So there's spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. I expect everybody to know what a poker deck looks like and how many cards are in it, etc. So what's the probability of a nine of diamonds? Well, that's right here. There's one card that's a nine of diamonds out of 52 cards total. What's the probability it's a black card? Well, there's two rows of black cards out of four total. So you could say, you know, it's a half, or you could realize there's 13 cards there, 13 cards there, so that's 26 out of 52. So two out of four, one out of two, 26 out of 52, whatever. I left these unreduced because I just didn't want to bother that much, but if, if you want to reduce them, that's fine. Or you can make a decimal. All right, what about aces? Well, there's four aces out of 52 total, so it's four out of 52. Or if you think, oh, there's one for every 13 cards, that's another way to think about it. Right, this 4 out of 52 reduces to 1 out of 13. Now face cards are the cards that actually have faces on them, which are the jacks, queens, and kings. They have literal faces, nose, lips, all that stuff. So there's, as you can see, 3 for every 13 cards, or 12 total out of a 52 card deck. So you could write it either one of those ways, that's fine. Now what about a red spade? Well there is no red spade. Spades are black, so the probability of a red spade is 0. That'll come up a little bit later. So if, if something's impossible, it's zero. If aces are low and kings are high, like I have here, what's the probability of drawing an ace or higher? And the answer is one, a hundred percent. You have to draw something and everything's higher than an ace. So ace or higher is a hundred percent. Now why are these probabilities classical? Well, we didn't conduct an experiment and like draw cards out of a deck ourselves. We just assumed every card was equally likely based on the makeup of the deck and we figured out the probabilities based on that. Okay, that's classical. When you do things hypothetically, that's classical probability. And again, it's tied back to um, the mathematicians that were first thinking about all this stuff were thinking about it in a very theoret theoretical way. Uh, several of them, not just Cardano, but a few of them actually made their living off of rich friends this way. So they figured out rules and probability, they knew how to count cards, and they did it to their friends and made money off of them. So they applied it to real life situations, which is something else we'll learn in another couple pages called empirical probability. Um, but the theory behind it is classical probability. So if you ever watch, um, I don't know, the World Series of Poker on ESPN, they'll say, you know, here's his hand, he's got a 70% chance of winning. What they're doing is, is classical probabilities. The computer knows based on what's out and what's been dealt, what the chances are of, you know, each individual winning the hand. All right, I'll meet you back here for the next page. See you then.